again, second only uh, Q live Q&A of the day. So things are still a little bit rusty, but believe me, by the end of the morning, we will be uh, a well-oiled machinery. So hi, Marcus, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, I really liked, uh, most people might have forgotten, but you started your uh, presentation with the uh, <laughs> in a very dark room and with uh, this typical note of uh, dry German humor that I particularly uh, liked. Well, as I told you, um, we're, we're born without humor. So any, any sense of humor yeah. we have is, is the result of very hard work. <laughs> well, I, I can confirm, therefore, that uh, your work is evident in this particular remark. Uh, so as we did before, and perhaps this time more punctilious, punctiliously, terrible adverb, that's why I'm an English major, uh, we will be taking questions first from the pad, and then we'll be moving on to uh, people in the BBV room. Let me just check if we have some people. We do have some people. All right, okay. so Marcus, I'm going to ask you the questions in the, in, the, in the pad, unless you have something to remark first. Yes. Oh, no, no, I don't have nothing to remark. I mean, only that uh, uh, we're coming to the end of the term here, and I think in the paper that I wrote, I um, expressed doubt that Emacs was good for beginners, but I've now um, gone back to, um, to a uh, interactive notebook in the class without Emacs, and I've just missed right. it terribly the whole term. And I think there's <laughs> even more too, so that's kind of interesting. That's it. Right. All right, well, let's get started with the questions because I'm a little worried that we sure. might uh, acquire t uh, debt uh, with regards to the time that we have. And just to be clear, so that you also know the time at which we're supposed to be finishing, uh, the next talk here on this track is supposed to be at uh, 10.40, which is in 13 minutes from now. All right, with that said, starting with the first questions, what tools do you use for making your slides? They are very nice, and I concur. Um... Uh, I use Org Reveal. Org Reveal. Was it? Org Reveal. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, well, it's a package. Uh, Org Reveal. Um, I don't have the link right now, but it's an it's an Org mode package uh, where you um, you create some some meta information, and uh, I think it's basically JavaScript JavaScript. Uh, package that will work from a bunch of different um, um, bunch of different uh, platforms but um, it works particularly well from Emacs so you, you use that a lot right yeah I, I think it is definitely interacting with JavaScript in the background and it makes for a very clean presentation right yeah, from see. Emacs I mean it's not opened in Emacs unless you use a web browser in Emacs that supports yeah. such uh, compositing. But it's pretty convenient, and I recommend looking into it. I think uh, I'm going to share the, the, I'm just going to share the uh, URL here. Okay. So if anybody's interested. Right. And we'll be putting all the links right now. So obviously, right now, Marcus is writing uh, inside of his own Emacs, but we also have the pad. We'll make sure that you have all the links accessible a little bit later. OK, moving on to the next question. Why MDPI? Oh. Yeah, well, that's a bit, little bit of a longer answer, kind of boring, I suppose. Right. So I, when I came here to the US, um, I used to talk, teach a lot of graduate courses, and I had to suddenly teach a lot of undergraduate courses, which partly motivated this uh, this move, because it made me realize, as I said in the, um, in the presentation, how little the students understand of the underlying infrastructure and how important it is for them to work with an IDE that doesn't make coding especially convenient, but that teaches them a lot of the stuff, stuff on the side, you know, while still presenting a very smooth um, uh, environment, which developers appreciate as well. So um, I came here and I, I used to publish like four or five research papers per year, but I didn't have the time. So uh, I was contacted by MDPI. Um, and it's one of those uh, research paper mills, which seem to be springing up where authors can, um, uh, really the institutions of the authors have to pay so that they can publish, right? So it's not really, uh, and I checked them out and there seemed to be proper peer review publishing, but to be absolutely sure, I said, well, you can have my article, uh, but of course for free, and I'm not gonna pay for you to publish it. And so um, that's what they did. They invited me and I, um, 
I submitted the paper. And it was a very good process. That was a very, it was a good peer review critique. So I changed the paper quite a bit. It's still not a great paper. It's just a small case study. You know, it's the kind of thing that, uh, that you have a lot in, uh, in medical research where also people don't have a lot of time to, to, to do research, proper research, which takes a very long time. And so that's why MDPI. And they are, they are in the most of the uh, relevant citation indices. So they are reputable enough. I mean, normally, I would say for anybody who does anything like this, you might not even want to bother with uh, the journal these days anymore. You just go straight to ArcScive, um, put out your preprint. And in fact, what will happen if you're on ArcScive, if somebody finds it interesting, they're going to reach out to you to, uh, to capture your paper and uh, have it published under their, um, under their heading. Oh yeah, actually the other reason why I wanted MDPI is because they were open access from the start. Uh, and I really like, if you go to the paper, I really like the way it's presented. So I looked at a few, um, a few papers and I thought it's a really nice, um, uh, it's a really nice online access, online open access solution. That's the long answer, sorry. No, that was perfectly fine, and you provided many details, so it was far from uh, a boring answer, let me reassure you. Um, moving on to the question, we only have about eight minutes left, so I'd like to finish those two questions and let people in the audience speak. Sure. So, do you think immersion can, uh, can be achieved on teaching other students with different backgrounds? Oh yeah, yeah uh, that's a really good question. Um, um, I, I had actually a discussion last night with my wife in bed about this, about the use of textbooks, which are famously non-immersive because they're consumed away from the class. You know, very rarely you sit in class like people used to do and read something together. Maybe they do that in English. And that is, of course, instantly immersive. But in computer science, many other topics, psychology, you know, biology and so on, um, you cannot get immersion, at least not in a lecture theater, you get it in a lab because people solve the problem and then they're immersed in it. So but my, my answer would be, yes, I can think totally immersion can be achieved anywhere. But what you have to do is you have to not lecture. <laughs> and you have to, to let students do work as you go along. So I used to lecture quite a bit because I was an insecure young professor. And you just read all my slides and my notes as I used to use, as everybody uses to when they start. Um, but then as I went along, I realized, you know, I've got such a grasp of the topic that I really, everything I do now is prepared in Emacs in an interactive way. So I start saying a few words and then the students immediately will get to work. And they seem yeah. to love that because in most of the other classes, people just talk at them, they take their stuff home and work at home, which is, of course, is super. But most of the students, if they have, in, at least in a liberal arts college, they have five other classes, they do not uh, take a lot of time to do the work at home. So it's, um, you know, yeah, it's kind of different. It's kind of risky, yeah, but I mean, the main point I was trying to make is Emacs and org mode really helped me to, to boil that interactive session down to something that will work in the classroom. I don't have to jump around between platforms. For example, this term, when I didn't use Emacs in the class with the students, I had to render using a package um there's actually a very nice package called uh what called ox what's it called ox uh, ox ipnb uh, i think it's called ox ipnb so what it does is uh, it renders in the usual way with emacs org mode does renders interactive uh, uh, notebook files in jupyter and that took me a lot of time uh, and I, I immediately notice as soon as the teacher has to fight platforms themselves they take the ball off the immersion task, you know, to keep the yeah. student on the problem. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, very there, much. And I, oh, go on, please. Yeah. Uh, I was I, going to remind uh, Yeah, I suppose, I, I suppose it might be MIT no. style. The big difference, though, my classes are very, very short, small. So I have like between 10 and 15 students per class. One of the reasons why I went to this college is because I was fed up teaching, trying to teach hundreds of students and Okay, sorry. Uh, do some of your students nag you about using VS Code? Yes, they do, but their arguments aren't very good. Um, because they, they, haven't really, they haven't really compared Emacs and VS Code. And what I do, actually, I use for I use R Studio as well, demonstrate VS Code, R Studio, and uh, and uh, and Emacs. And um, uh, it's, I think it's very 
very easy easy for them to see and there are some videos about that as well how much easier it is to get into emacs to limit your 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 investment to what you actually want to do I mean, the problem with vs code is it comes at you with this sort of microsoft store ideology like you know a gazillion plugins which if you're a developer you know what you want and uh, i mean it's a bit like uh, vs code is like uh, google search for as if you were programming in google search uh, complete waste of time having said that i've also seen some videos with people who really know how to use vs code and of course you know if, if somebody gets on the inside of a of a of a tool and spends upwards of uh, a thousand hours in the tool they'll be great but that's not true for beginners yeah so uh hold on there's another one um, i'm reading them sorry <laughs> Leo. I can, see the, I can see the questions but you may want to turn them around um no 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 please please feel free to read them i'm on your facilitator to some of you too so that's the nagging i teach simple program at the vocational school and even after showing the students vim vim of course is a contender and nano attender prefer emacs uh, they still all should choose VS Code as their editor. Well, okay, what I did is mandatory. I didn't let them choose. <laughs> that's what I did. And I thought that was quite risky, but in the end, it turns out that the best students loved it and keep using Emacs in their jobs. I hear that now. The students, uh, students in the sort of in the middle, who were probably the ones who would pick VS, pick VS Code because every Every tutorial they see, every they learn a lot to YouTube, and so everything they see is in VS Code. If there were more tutorials in Emacs, I'm trying to make some, then uh, of course that would be different. Um, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure. It's yeah, it's I think it's a part partly brainwashing and partly, of course, the other reason is there is no online Emacs. You know, they use VS Code Dev, right? And that's of course, you know, they use uh, they use an online cloud solution. Like most of the students in the high school, I teach Python in the high school right now, and the students only get Chromebooks that are completely cut down to to nothing. They cannot uh, they cannot have uh, Linux on their Chromebooks. Uh, so what are they supposed to do? Their only choice really is Replit. Replit.com is a possibility for them to do that. But uh, you know, or uh, they use Code Spaces, which is VS Code in GitHub. Yeah. So. Um, Marcus, sorry um, for the interruption. We only have about two minutes left, so if you could take one question, that would be great. Sorry. Um, yeah, observe the same behavior. Having more tutorials would be most welcome. Yes, I, I'd love to. I'd spend uh, the rest of my days on this earth making Emacs tutorials if I can. Um, thank you. The approach to handling EDA. Oh, yeah, with white data sets. Mm. Um, well, that's a good point. Um, so Marcus, I don't want to put you under too much pressure to yeah, answer the question. The, the, Emacs, uh, the, the handling EDA, uh, I don't know. If you look at the comments, I think these are on YouTube, right? At some point, Leo? Oh, yes, they will definitely be on YouTube. Uh, and I'm just to be clear. The question so, you asked about the EDA, that's too long to go into right now. Plus, my cat is here. And sure. So, so I'm going to answer oh, that in the comments, all right? Uh, start up sure, but not only that. Yes, I'm going to post that. I'm going to post that in the comments as well. Sure, but also, uh, just to be clear, Marcus, you're going to continue the discussion. It's just oh, the cool. uh, stream that we'll be moving on to the next talk in about 50 seconds. Right. So Marcus, yeah. feel free to keep answering questions inside this room. You also yeah. have people, we're going to check uh, aside uh, with the stream, we have a number of people in the room. You can see them on the left on the blue button who are probably going to unmute themselves and ask you questions. So feel free to stay in the room. Uh, answer as lengthily as you want the questions because that's more content for us and we love it obviously but it's just that i personally will be leaving to take care of the rest of the talks so marcus you have any last words before we move on uh, no just thank you for this wonderful i'm going to copy this uh, i i don't think i listened to the talk by sasha yet but i'm going to do that because i really want to copy this uh, conference format i think that is the conference format of the future using volunteers to put together conferences so i can't wait nobody wants to come to batesville where i am but thank you so much that was really super professional i love that great okay we are almost perfectly on time uh, i think we cut off about uh one or two seconds into the last sentence you said but otherwise we were splendidly on time so thank you so much marcus you're welcome um so i wanted to say a little bit about that question uh, about handling eda mm. 
I mean, I so use email. Can, can, can you see the chat on the, on the left? Because people have started asking questions on the left. Can you see the chat? Oh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. So you've got multiple, you've got multiple yeah. avenues to question. Yeah, can you answer questions yeah, from the panel? Okay, I'm just going to go into that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Sure. Okay, I'll uh, need to go now. So, Marcus, have a great day, and I'll probably see you later. Yeah, thank you. So, bye bye. There was a question about the. Uh, I wanted to ask the answer the question about EDA in large um, large data sets. So, I mean, I teach um, undergraduate now. So, uh, there's a limited number of courses like in it where I use actually have big data. Uh, big data issues, and um, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not that I don't run into performance issues with Emacs. I obviously do, but like the performance issues uh, in Emacs are comparable to performance issues, for example, when using R. Right? In R, everything is in memory, so uh, you are limited, you know, to the uh, to the available uh, what is it, two gig by gigabyte or whatever memory of your computer. So you'll have to find other infrastructure solutions anyway. The advantage um, of using Emacs is that um, I can, within one org mode file, uh, connect to an external database. Um, uh, I can even, as probably most of you know, I can even use it as a text-based web browser if I want to. So I could look at individual um, uh, uh, files. Um, and the other point of EDA, of course, is um, that you're not supposed to look at the tables. You're supposed to get the basic, um, the basic, uh, the basic frame of your of your data. Is there a header? You know, what's the approximate size and stuff like that. And then you're supposed to import it into a data frame, ideally, at least in portions. Um, and I don't think, um, uh, yeah. So that's that's it. But to, to the full answer is that I have not done big data analysis in Emacs. So that's actually a really nice extension. I'm going to write that down as a as a, um, as a thing to talk about in some future talk. OK, so EDA with big data. Um, even though interesting would be to know what kind of size of data you're actually talking about. Yeah. So I don't know, um, up, what, what is it, upwards of uh, one terabyte or something like that? I don't know. That'd be interesting to know. I haven't, haven't done that in class. So there's another question. Um, proportion of students that you think will keep on using Emacs after your course? That's not a difficult question because, as I said, I have very small classes. I've been here since two years. So I'm in touch with all almost all the students. In fact, I'm getting them work after after school, so that's really cool. And um, everybody who took to Emacs um, really seriously, so probably about 25% or so, keep using Emacs after, afterwards. I mean, even in, in the job, right, in the professional field. Uh, who, those who keep using Emacs after the course, I think the uh, number is greater, but I have not followed up on that. I have to, um, my guess is uh, more than half, I would say. Half or more than half. Oh, Aaron, thank you so much. That's very sweet. But um, I didn't think the presentation was great. I was thinking about redoing it. But this is actually the first take. So it was late. I had lots of other stuff to do. And um, I think I'm, what I'm more interested in uh, than uh, papers is probably this idea of making, uh, making Emacs-based data science videos, because there aren't many out there. Most of the people who do um, and computer science. Most people who do that are not either developers and certainly not teachers. So I think that's a good idea. I'm going to pick that up. So to do make more um, Emax based data science videos. Is there anything else? More people. There are some people here in the room still. If you do a PS share on work. Or when? Uh, or Wiki. Uh, what's my YouTube channel? Oh, yeah, I'm going to give you the, uh, uh, I, I've got a bunch of different YouTube channels. I'm going to put them in the comments to my to my talk. Hold on, the, uh, 
the one where I have the latest Emacs videos. You find my name. I, there's nobody in the world with my name. So if you look for Birkenkra um, on YouTube, um, then you will find it. But uh, yeah, I got a bunch of them. Hold on, I'm going to give you the. Find it. my channel okay uh, he, this one has only got a few videos but um so there's there's one with a lot more um few recent videos and um i'm going to post more other other ones um, in the comments of this video okay what else? I'm trying to find my way back to the um, big blue button. Okay, cool. Oh, yes, thank you. I will. That's very good. Thank you so much. Of course, I use walk. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of it. Very good. I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting. That's something that comes to my mind. When I was a young student, right, people who used Emacs and uh, uh, the, the web wasn't particularly large. So the volunteers would automatically make videos, but not for commercial purposes. Now you have an army of people who uh, make commercial videos and the videos are usually good for the first 10% of every content, but as soon as it gets a little more difficult, they either don't know what to do anymore or they don't do it uh, because there's, it's not commercially viable. There's the number of people who move on is gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it, there's no commerce anymore. But when I was a student, um, pretty much all the documentation everywhere was created by volunteers, just like this conference or like anything in org mode. Um, and that doesn't seem to be a, much of a trend anymore, but maybe we can resurrect it. So, um, yes, I'm definitely going to contribute to that. Multiple people are typing here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm going to put that. I'm going to rectify that in the in the comment. Having said that, I am not 100% sure that I didn't lie here. It may just be because I didn't have much time to put the presentation together. And it's perfectly possible that that's actually Google Slides and not Org Reveal. In the classroom, when I present and just do lectures, I always do reveal. But uh, most of the time, I do a uh, tree slide. That's the quickest way to do it for me. So, um, so presentation. Hold on, let me just copy this one. Make sure that this doesn't get lost. Thank you so much for that. And uh, presentations in class. Uh, I use sometimes org present, but there are issues with the font sometimes. Uh, I use tree slide most of the time and org reveal. But this one is my this one is my top my top tool. Of course, this is not org, so forget about that. Okay. Yeah. Also, you know, you can send me your. Um, you got my email, I think, from the end, if you're interested in following up or less letting me know about your stuff. It might be interesting to, I don't know, it might be interesting to put together a conference or a little seminar just for educators. DF is still typing. I'm waiting.
actually our mode maintainer Bastian uh, was Sorry. <laughs> was talking about uh, like possibility to have like just org mode conference. Yeah. But uh, the question is like, is it worth making a whole separate one? A whole separate one what? A uh, whole separate org dedicated conference. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, probably would be. Actually, it's just uh, like you see how Emacs Conf is well done. So it's like creating anything as good is tricky. Yes. So it... No, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, uh... I mean, look, it's anywhere like half of Emacs Conf is anywhere remote. <laughs> so like, it's almost the same. Yeah. Well, I suppose at this point, I don't know if that's what you mean. Org mode is probably what attracts people to Emacs uh, in the first place. Like, uh, uh, I suppose Org Rome is the uh, maybe the biggest one for people even outside of computer science. Uh, I use Org Rome for everything, uh, but there are, I mean, the the thresholds. I think that the maintainer or maybe the creator of org mode has claimed and said for many years that org, org mode itself doesn't actually necessarily need Emacs. You can have it uh, as a completely separate application as well. But I, for a number of reasons, I don't like that. I really like the idea to have it inside Emacs. Um, well, the, so the, 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 the current is that uh, it has to be Emacs because uh, the configurability is one of the strong points anyway. That's true. So that's you true. cannot make a separate application without No, that's Emacs. true. That, that, I was going to say that. The thing is, you use the flexibility. Plus, you also use the, I don't know if that's the right word, but you use there's something about the, uh, the free ideology of Emacs that uh, is what attracted me to it in the first place um, when I was younger and that I find even more important now. Um, you know, so, you know, what they say, the community aspect. I mean, the reason, you know, the, the main reason why Python is so big today, really. So, yeah. But uh, in, in terms of uh, going out of Emacs, it's org syntax that is supposed to be, uh, like, breaking out of Emacs. Yeah. So, like, there's a plan to lay out uh, the actual standard document so that uh, yeah. you can register the format officially. Yeah, I think I've heard that too. I've not followed up on it much. I don't know what the, um, um, I mean, that probably would, it would strength very likely if you do that, it would, at least for a short time, strengthen org mode and weaken Emacs. Um, I don't know what other examples, if there are other examples of, uh, applications pulled out of um, IDEs like that. I'm not aware of any others. Well, uh, actually, um, people are trying to make tree seater grammar. People are trying to make like some external parsers, a lot of them. All right, cool. And uh, a lot of stuff is done on the mobile part, like Android, iOS, especially recently. So things that are Emacs independent are uh, demanded. Yeah. OK, yeah. And I have no doubt that there is a demand. Um, I mean, Especially I didn't get in mobile, into, like yeah. every time. Yeah, I mean, I didn't get into that very much. I have uh, some of my students have zero affinity with com with computers. Um, they really don't know their way around their computers at all, and um, um, so for them, it is quite important to learn how to find your way around Emacs because it's. Uh, well, it's a, you know, it's like a little operating system, but it's not. Right? It's an operating system without, uh, without much of the obscurity. And um, the alternative to that would be to simply let them work only on the command line, which is another possibility. But um, you know, there of course you are limited uh, with regard to if you want to swap languages. Yeah. So, for example, quite, quite often I find myself in the situation, I teach data science in R and Python, and in Emacs org mode, I can demonstrate both of these side by side in the same, uh, in the same file. And that's, you know, uh, that's a great advantage. No, not to overburden the students when they are 
begin at the beginning with things that you don't want them to necessarily learn about. And plus the thing, what I liked as a graduate student when I stepped onto Emacs was that um, it was infinite possibilities to, uh, yeah, to, to, to lose myself in Emacs and, you know, go on and learn more stuff about it. But that's such a long time ago that only uh, I barely dare to mention it anymore. For command line, actually, it's since the Jupyter notebooks and like that Google thing they uh, they are running uh, is getting so popular that uh, it's clear that command line is just losing uh, in popularity in this. In a sense. Yeah. That, well. Yes and no. I mean. Uh, oh, of Jupyter course. Uh, Jupyter Lab. Talking about popularity, oh, well. not the usage. Yeah, people are still using it, obviously. I mean, in in Google Colab. Only the paid version allows you to go to the terminal and use the command line. Um, but of course, the, the, the attraction, and I think that's kind of interesting. The re one of the reasons why IPython or uh, any of the Jupyter notebooks are so cool is because you can use a lot of shell commands from the IPython shell. You know, they have a there's a whole bunch of um, of magic commands which are quite powerful. I mean, the the one that comes to mind is uh, time. Uh, the time command, for example, you know, gives you a really nice uh, performance, quick performance check. There's a bunch of different, I think, probably close to 100 magic commands that you can use in Jupyter. Um, but I don't know Jupyter Lab too well, but I noticed that uh, the companies that do online training, and they are usually the ones that are uh, closest to what beginners want, especially in business. And what those companies do is they, um, you know, they take, um, they take Jupyter Lab and turn it into a presentation of their own. Another one is Notable, Notable.io. That's another one. They they took uh, Jupyter Lab and turn it into something commercial, spruce it up a little bit. Um, and so it, the shell inside the Jupyter Lab has some of the most more important shell properties. And so people still use the command line without knowing that they use the command line. But I also like doing, uh, how do I use Orgroom? Um, well, I use it, uh, I do not have not used it with the students yet. Only the best students have sort of seen me use it and copied it. Um, but I, I use it probably in a very naive, trivial way. I can't say that I am, um, that I have a very sophisticated use. I basically, I like the fact I mean, the, 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 it's built on the original concept of the, with the German word Zettelkasten, right? Which is that um, you do not have to think about a taxonomy because as you move along, your taxonomy changes all the time. You know, what you think is important at the beginning, your root node, as you go along, you realize, oh, that's not the root node at all. There's a higher level and a higher level. And some of the lower levels are not at the lower level. They're actually at the higher level. So you're, you're beginning to, um, uh, to create hierarchies that are out of date as soon as you create the hierarchy. So what is the idea of the Tettle custom is that anything that comes to your mind, you can throw in the custom, the box. It literally means a uh, box of notes. And uh, that's what I appreciate about it. So I create a, um, uh, I create a note pretty much for anything I do, but I've only used it for about a year and a half or so, or grown, maybe a year. Um, so I can see that I'm coming up against the Zettelkasten or note box problems, which is that I've got so many notes now um, that unless I have clever aliases, uh, there is a chance that I might forget that I have a note. So I oh, need that, a... That's why you need meta notes. Yes, yes. In other words, the summarization is important, no matter yes. what system you use. Yes. Yeah. But it, what I'm trying to say is that's a different approach than hierarchies, right? It's the same, you know, it's the same, it's the same principle as a relational database versus a hierarchical database. Same thing. So, um, yeah, and I've have, I have not used that. I've not really used, actually, I have, I've got meta notes. Of course I do. So notes that point to other notes. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I use those. Oh, I have to copy that. Yeah, other names, uh, topic notes. Yeah. I'm not. I have not taught that part to the students because, 
I do project work with the students, um, but there's only so much time. I'm already, I mean, uh, already, I don't think there's any class that where I am able to use more than 30% of of my uh, of my material and the reason is that when the students come to class which is i pointed out in the video they know so little and uh, most of the students at least in liberal arts spend just too little time outside of class getting their you know drilling down into the into the into the infrastructure into the work only only the best students do that the ones that really catch fire uh, don't you know. have like something like a course project at the end Yes, I have course, not at the end. I use Scrum. Maybe I shouldn't, but I've used Scrum for many years. So I, uh, I have course projects that start at the beginning and they do sprint reviews every three or four weeks. Um, so uh, term end projects I find completely useless because the students do the work at the very end of the term. And so I. Oh, no. I, by, by term end, I mean uh, they don't start at the end, they just uh, report at the end. Yeah. I use the IMRAD, I use the IMRAD method. So I use IMRAD, basically IMRAD uh, plus, plus Scrum, right? So, so the first sprint review is introductory, the research proposal, the second one is about methodology, the third one about the results, and the last one is their final presentation. And um, so that's the way I manage the projects, but that's about as much um, as I can do with them. Uh, it's, a, it's a good idea. I hadn't even thought about using org Rome with them. But to teach them that might be a good idea, actually. Well, uh, for Orgrom, actually, what I found useful during my graduate is uh, like for literature review. Yes. Because the other part of Orgrom that is not about your, like, noting down your thoughts, is about yeah. uh, writing down uh, literature notes. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. And of course, I mean, there's more stuff that they should learn, you know, like, uh, Another one, since you mentioned lip, literature, uh, you know, LaTeX and BibTeX is another uh, obvious extension of that. Um, but that is actually a good idea because the, the lit literature is what they have the hardest time with. Um, yeah, like when you need to read like 50 papers, and then yeah. you click well, at once. Last term, since you mentioned that, I had a really nice experience because a, a one of our librarians, our digital librarian, came along and talked to the students, and he taught me about a tool called litmap.com, which is basically, a, a, I don't know how it's implemented, but it's basically a graph, um, a graph representation of papers organized by citation. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very cool. And, this, and the students who use, used to only find, I don't know, one paper and otherwise, of course, 15 YouTube videos and, and 100 blogs, suddenly started uh, finding um, and reading scientific papers. It was only because of this presentation. So you should take the, um, I think, I hope that is the right, uh, that's the right mode, uh, lit maps. Okay, it's, it's not lit map, it's called lit maps. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example. I don't know if you can, sh if I can share this, if you can look at that, but, uh, uh, Basically, you you create a one. Of, can you use one of yours your papers as a seed, and then it will create a graph uh, graph representation of it for you. And this is a powerful tool uh, in itself. But what I'm saying is that the students suddenly their use of literature and their citation goes through the roof. And I've been waiting for that for probably 15 years since I've started teaching. So it's crazy. That's a really cool. So here is the same tool. It's called Connected Papers. It's based on the open source citation data. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I know that as well. I think I don't know why. It, it's actually why? very useful when you just start learning the topic. It's like you you find one paper, then you look into the connections. You can quickly narrow down to the like most cited the core papers on the topic. Yeah. yeah. Of course, and that is exactly their situation, you know, and they're always uh, at the beginning. As you go on, uh, you develop different ways, but for these complete beginners, that's, that's a good idea. Thank you so much for that. Okay, guys, anything else? I've enjoyed the conversation, so you should definitely, um, I'm going to take some of these things away. Thank you so much for the uh, 
for that. Have you done, uh, Yanta, have you done uh, org mode documentations yourself on Walk? Or do you have a, a sort of a favorite one? I mean, I often on Walk, I often use the, uh, the documentation for code blocks. I used to when I started doing that for the first time. Yeah, because it's only on work. It's, it's not part yeah. of the manual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I've used that a lot. In terms of how I done, uh, not really. Mostly fixing uh, errors there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be at this conference. I think I'm gonna gonna get on. Thanks for answering all the questions. And for the talk, it was quite interesting to see org mode used in the in actual teaching. Yes, thank you. And I, I got to thank uh, Daniel German from Canada, the one I had him on one of his slides because he he inspired me to do that. And uh, and I wouldn't be at the conference if I hadn't contacted him and said, oh, here's my paper, and he said, oh, you should come to the conference. And so that's why I came to the conference. Anyway, thank you very much. And uh, as they say, uh, keep in touch. You're welcome. Okay, bye bye. Take a copy of the uh, of the chat if you before you go, if you can. Happy weekend too. Cheers. Bye bye. You are currently the only person in this conference.